day, everybody. I'm Lauren Wolfson. I'm Global Head of Policy and Stakeholder Engagement in the Corporate Governance and Secretariat team at HSBC. And I'm very pleased to be taking part um, in this important dialogue and sharing this panel with this distinguished group of colleagues who each bring their own area of expertise and experience to the discussion. I will not introduce them in great detail as their bios are available online, and I would prefer to use the time to get their insights. That said, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the panelists. Firstly, Aisha Sultan, who is a non-executive director and experienced strategy professional. Maria Stel Ray, who is a senior policy analyst in corporate governance at the OECD. John Wilcox, chairman emeritus of Morris Sadali, and Andrew Johnston, commercial director and group company secretary for Sun International. Thank you all for your participation today. At this point in time, we are all very aware that the challenges presented by the pandemic required an immediate, intense, and unprecedented transformation in board practice. For boards, as stewards of the corporation, these challenges included virtual boardrooms, dynamic risk assessment, continuity, resilience, and thoughts on board composition. Phil Armstrong has, and extraordinarily in the time available to him, managed to capture some of the fundamental board issues arising from the pandemic and has provided a great introduction, not only to our panel, but to other panel discussions that will happen over the coming days on these issues. And we intend to explore some of these in relation to board effectiveness. Although the pandemic inevitably led to corporate failures, there was also much success. The discussion is timely and provides us with an opportunity to pause, reflect, and consider learnings and how we might take these forward to both enhance the role of boards as corporate stewards and ensure agility of boards. As a starting point, I would like to ask each of the panelists to highlight a key learning from the pandemic and its impact on board effectiveness. Firstly, Aisha as a non-executive director during the time of the crisis, it would be good to hear your views on the impact of the crisis in relation to board effectiveness. Thank you, Lauren. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you're well where you are around the world. And it's a great pleasure, really, to be here with you today. Um, as Lauren mentioned, I sit as a non-executive director on a non-for-profit educational institute based in Dubai. And um, the fundamental key takeaway I would take from COVID is the importance of technology. Uh, we faced it right, um, you know, at, at the coal face, as, as they say. Um, our business model fundamentally had to change because of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, as an institute, we um, give um, lectures, uh, we hold cultural events, um, we do everything surrounding the language, exams for people immigrating to different countries, etc. And that was all done in person. And while as a board we had considered technology and the importance of it and had planned in the budgets, you know, to bring in technology, we were really faced uh, with a dilemma when everything shut down and people didn't want to come into the institute and we had no choice but to put in a significant investment into technology infrastructure to effectively move what we were doing face to face online um, and so for us technology really was a massive um, uh, change maker if you like and I think the winner really out of, out of COVID-19. There were a couple of other things that just to, to mention for key takeaways. Um, we did a lot of scenario planning. We had to do a lot of scenario planning. And that's something that's dear to my heart as a strategy person, you know, having worked and developed scenarios uh, over my career. But as a board member, it was also very interesting to see how they, they had to be used. You know, we were in situations where we didn't know whether we, we should just give up face-to-face -face, uh, meetings if lockdown was going to continue for a very long time, whether we needed a hybrid solution, which was to start in reintroducing some of the old model back in. And scenarios <laughs> kind of helped us develop that and think through the consequences and, and better plan for that. And I'd say the third takeaway for us really was about being nimble. Um, and you know, being able to adapt, and we had to do that. I mean, uh, as I said, you know, if you go in the next day uh, and your business model has changed and your revenue is down, um, you know, you, you you have to be nimble. You have to be able to to change and adapt. And I think COVID pushed that 
agenda agenda forward. So those are the main three for me. Technology is a key takeaway and the importance of it. Um, and we can speak later on about the positive and the negative because you know Philip uh, mentioned very well about you know the cybersecurity and all of the increase that, that that that's coming on board with that and how we really have to integrate strategy not only sorry technology not only into the strategy but you know have also the compliance there that's able to capture all of the issues that come with cybersecurity and and opening up so technology scenario planning and having a board that's able to adapt and change in a, in a time of uncertainty and diversity also plays a part in that and we can talk a little bit later about uh, about that great thanks Aisha Andrew Thank you. from your perspective and an operational board perspective what were your key takeaways from the pandemic thanks Lauren and good afternoon everyone it's a real privilege to be able to uh, have this session with you this afternoon so I think you know, from my perspective maybe just for the audience's perspective just to give you a bit of a background you know we we in a public listed company here in South Africa um, in hospitality and gaming, so very much at the coal face of the impact of uh, COVID on, on corporates, if you can call it that. Um, you know, literally, uh, you know, without sort of uh, feeling like one developed a persecution complex here in South Africa, um, what was very obvious is that the, the regulations that were promulgated under the Disaster Management Act here in South Africa um, Literally every regulation had a material impact on our business, whether it was a, a prohibition on the sale or distribution of alcohol, which obviously directly impacts into hospitality and gaming, to you know extended curfews that uh, were, were implemented depending on the alert level that we were subjected to, um, very, very stringent social distancing restrictions here in South Africa, where we were literally allowed 50 people maximum in a casino or on a particular floor. Um, and then obviously accompanied by the various hard and soft lockdowns that we've been going through, depending on you know, where we are in which phase in South Africa. So, so for us, we really went from a business as usual type of scenario to what I call a business unusual scenario. Um, and that's required a number of toolkits um, and, and strategies to be adopted to be able to deal with the new normal, if I can call it that, or the business unusual. I think so, several of the key themes, and I think, uh, as, as Aisha said, you know, we'll unpack them as we go along. But I think just if I could list some of what the lessons we learned and the takeaways from an operational perspective. Um, investing in preparedness is no longer a luxury, and I want to start with that. I think, you know, the pandemic caught everyone on their left foot. Um, and it really brought to the fore issues around strategy, uh, planning, um, you know, crisis management and the like. And I think, you know, if, if one lesson came out of all of this, which is very, very pertinent, it's, you know, to be prepared. I think crises like COVID and other pandemics is going to be something which as a planet, we're gonna to have to get used to going forward with. Um, and this sure won't be the last one. So I think that, that was the first takeaway. Secondly, communication is key. Absolutely, if we learned nothing else, it was the necessity and the importance of communicating with all stakeholders, both intra-group and extra-group. And I think what this really highlighted for us was this corporate governance concept around moving away from a shareholder exclusive to a stakeholder inclusive approach. Um, whether it was having to chat to staff, look after staff, uh, chat to your bankers, chat to, to your shareholders, the communities in which you operate, the supply chains. Um, the world really did come together in a strange kind of way. And I think collaborated uh, in, in, in accordance with a lot of the principles that I think King uh, or corporate governance in any event is, is predicated on. So I think that was a second really very key takeaway. I think virtual meetings are now going to become part of a company's landscape. I think we've all seen that. And we'll unpack that a little bit later. Um, similar to Aisha, I think you know, crises require agile and innovative decision making. And so we saw adaptations to the way in which we conduct ourselves both at a management and at a board level that was, was very, very important. Uh, contingency planning is an absolute must. Um, and I'll link that again to, I think, risk review assessments, again, both internal and external. 
Um, technology became an enabler. I think uh, Ayesha also touched on that. So it's not an end in itself, but I think what it has done is it has fast tracked the way we operate and probably will continue to operate in future, whether it's through electronic board pads, for board meetings, to Zoom and Teams meetings, to proxy voting at general meeting, uh, e-resolutions uh, if you deal in the secretarial corporate administration side. So really technology has stepped up to the plate, but uh, not without some challenges as well. Um, and then last of all, I think a key takeaway was the relationships intra and extra the company have changed, whether it's from the company secretary to the chairman, to the CEO, the board members, shareholders and stakeholders, and all of them together. I think um, we have definitely seen a change in the way companies manage those relationships and the, necessi the necessity really for there to be full alignment uh, on strategy, values, culture uh, at a board and at a, at, a, at a shareholder level. And then obviously the board taking the lead um, and, and walking the talk and not just talking the talk. So I think those are some of the sort of really key themes that we saw, uh, particularly within our industry coming out of COVID. Thanks, Andrew. Before, there's a couple of points that I'd like to pick up on, particularly, um, and, and both you and Aisha have picked up on some of Phil's key points around um, digitiz digitization um, and, and the future of, of how we operate. Um, but but also around collaboration and the role of various players. So we'll pick up on that in a moment. Before we do, I, I'd love to turn to John. Um, John, it'd be great to get your perspective from a more macro trend. What you saw trends coming, what you saw coming out of the crisis. Um, any key learnings around the role of the board and effectiveness? Thank you, Lauren. Um, for those of us who don't know Moro Sadali, we are a corporate advisory firm, and we work largely with listed companies, but also with a few private companies in their dealings with shareholders. And we do also provide transactional services for them with shareholder meetings, as well as their communications in the governance. I think it's very important to remember that even before the pandemic occurred, the companies were already facing a changed landscape because of ESG factors, environmental, social, and governance changes uh, were transforming the landscape in which corporations have to operate. And they were redefining the role and responsibilities of the board of directors in very fundamental ways. So these factors, these ESG factors, and I think we will probably be using this term throughout our discussion, um, include not only climate change and environmental issues, but also stakeholder governance and the idea that not only shareholders, but other stakeholders, including employees, and uh, suppliers and communities affected by the business um, were critical um, and needed to be considered uh, by the board of directors in its risk assessments primarily, but not only risk, but also opportunities for the growth of the business. So um, the, this represented a very dramatic change from the old days in which the primary criteria on which a company's performance was judged and even measured by the board of directors was financial. And of course, the audit is also uh, almost exclusively based on financial standards. We are now uh, really testing the limits of our financial way of judging and evaluating uh, companies. And this spreads also to the Board of Directors. The pandemic specifically required boards of directors to attend to issues, for example, of human capital management. Uh, as we've already heard from the other panelists, the pandemic had a huge impact on the uh, company's employees and their working relationship with the company itself. 
both physically and psychologically. And the, this created all kinds of risks. It also created opportunities for some companies. And so I think we have to think in those terms because I believe that these are permanent changes. Um, the combination of these ESG factors and the pandemic will, I think, fundamentally and permanently redefine the job of the board of directors. Um, they've already radically altered the landscape in which businesses have to operate. And so the board of directors have to think differently as well. Um, it's going to require a very clear demonstration of the director's independence from management for purposes of oversight. But at the same time, it's going to demand a deepening of the board's collaboration with management on strategic decision-making. So the old, the very old concept of the board of directors as an advisory group, basically helping the CEO do his or her job and getting into full gear only in a crisis, that has changed. And I think it's very fundamental and must be remembered as the people begin to rethink their role as corporate directors. Thanks, John. We will build on that in, in our further discussion because I think you raised some key points there about the changing role of the board um, and also the focus now on, as Andrew pointed to, alluded to, the uh, sort of enhanced stakeholder primacy model versus the old shareholder primacy model. So um, a lot of food for us to build on later. Just turning to Maria Stell, it'd be great if you could give us a perspective on obviously the crisis required policy um, reaction and response. Anything there that you think is relevant in relation to the impact on the effectiveness of boards, Maria Stell? Thank you, Lorraine, and uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to uh, to everybody. So, yeah, in my in this first uh, intervention, I would like really to focus on the regulatory landscape. You know, what were the regulatory reaction from from government, and of course, uh, looking you know at the these governmental temporary measures that has been taken during the crisis to adjust corporate governance requirements and their long lasting effect, possible lasting effect. You know. On, on, on company structure and boards, of course. So, as we all know, you know, since the begin since the beginning of the crisis, boards has been under very intense pressure due to uh, uh, the health crisis itself, you know, and to increase risk and challenges. Uh, uh, we already mentioned those, but employment and customers' health and safety, business disruption, liquidity issues regulatory compliance or cybersecurity. Therefore, governments around the world has been reacting to this crisis and they took some measures to adjust the regulatory landscape because of course, company were not able to meet certain legal and regulatory obligation. So one could say that these measures were uh, you know, erratic or incoherent, you know, as Philippe was saying in his introduction, but, it is, of course, given the nature of the crisis, it was difficult to have, a, you know, coherent and convergent measures, obviously. But the fact that there were really some some, some measures that were taken quite immediately by, uh, by by governments, for example, you know, regulators they offered possibilities of remote annual shareholders meeting or facilities on required disclosures. As regard to shareholders meeting. This is interesting, and we've already tackled this issue uh, among us. You know, the impact is likely to be really notable for the future. Uh, countries will probably clarify their regulatory framework for remote participation, and this should this should probably improve the possibilities for all shareholders to participate and follow the meetings, to pose questions uh, to corporate officers, to vote remotely. So there will really be an impact linked to the increased involvement of shareholders and therefore possibly an increased scrutiny over the board and management. Of course, we will have to find the right balance, of course, between remote meetings and in-person meetings, because we all know that we still need in-person meetings. 
but then we'll have to see, you know, there will be really an adaptation uh, on companies' practices, but also on regulations regarding this issue. So coming back to the temporary measures that was adopted during the crisis, now what regulator will need to do is to really decide on their temporality, but also to assess, you know, we are a, you know, a year and a half now from, from, from the, the, the onset of this type of measures, you know, to assess really what was the cost, what was the benefit of that. But one thing that we know for sure, even though these measures were temporary, the, the, the regulatory adjustment that has been taken will have long will have lasting effect on corporate governance, on how companies are governed. Uh, regulators will be much more likely now to look, you know, and to consider board liabilities, oversight, composition, the, the independence of members, and also the way they are managing risk you know, from health, climate, social risk, there'll be, you know, this risk management is really coming at the center. Of course, the relationship with shareholders, stakeholders, but also between the boards and executive are also likely to evolve and possibly be more regulated. So what we need now is really an evaluation, you know, of what happened, you know, kind of an assessment uh, for policymakers to see what worked, what didn't work, and how to adapt and adapt the regulation, but without over regulating. This is also a challenge uh, that we are uh, facing. And just to conclude this first, uh, this first intervention, I would like to mention that the, in the OECD, we are currently, uh, you know, moving to the review of our G20 OECD corporate governance principle which is an instrument that, you know, there's more like uh, 50 jurisdictions that have uh, adhered to, this, uh, to these principles. And uh, they were last reviewed in 2015. And now it will be really interesting to see, you know, in the year ahead, what are the reflection, or what we are talking about now, you know, will feed an element of review of, this, of these principles. The aim is to really give a tool for policymakers and regulators, you know, on uh, how to really assess all the global trends, but get some advice, uh, get, you know, receive some recommendations uh, uh, with the aim of having maybe a certain degree of convergence, uh, given a bit the, the multilateral nature of this, uh, of this tool. So I'll stop here and I give you back the floor, Lorraine. Thanks, Maria. So that's it to build on and hopefully the review of the OECD principles will take an account of learnings out of the crisis and and build those into the principles going forward. Um, just moving a couple of people mentioned and Aisha and, and, and Andrew, you both spoke about collaboration and also to an extent relationship with the board and the executive. I think this is a key relationship during the crisis. Um, good to get each of your brief perspectives on what that meant and the changing relationship that you saw. Aisha, I'll start with you just between board and management. Sure, and, and you know, I'm sharing with you exactly kind of what happened uh, live with, with us in the, in the board. Um, I mean, effectively the management were firefighting. So they were, they were, you know, at the front, they were the ones who were having to deal with the crisis day to day. And our role really as the board was kind of to empower them also to kind of make sure that they were communicating. And I think, um, uh, you know, one of my other panelists has mentioned the importance of communication to make sure that, you know, the employees knew what was going on, but also to have that crisis team. So I think, you know, the, the, uh, the relationship between the board and the executive really was one of pushing down maybe more authority and more decision making than, than, than at times uh, we, we would have wanted to, but simply because they were completely at the, at the front and at the face of um, dealing with the issues and firefighting. The second thing was that as a board, we had to really be supportive and be nimble. And I, I mentioned, you know, in our case, we had to approve a huge investment in, in the infrastructure of technology to, to push basically our business model online because, you know, our business model was, was dwindling. Um, and, you know, for the board to be able to do that, we had to have the confidence in, in the management. So we had a lot more meetings. Uh, meetings were now online, um, you know, but we, we, were, we were back and forth a lot more. And what I found is that the management team took a lot more of a lead 
in this case. And we as a board were there to reflect, give our feedback, um, kind of, you know, say, well, what, what, hold on a minute, have you considered these options? Um, but making sure that things were being communicated to the employees as well. Um, so that was, you know, going out more and more. Thanks, Asha. There, there, there was an interesting um, McKinsey's Global Survey, which released earlier this year in about April or so, which um, which looked at this and, and spoke to the greater collabor collaboration required between the executive and, man and management, the need for more meetings and the need for more collaboration, which then also had an impact on things like agenda setting, being more agile and doing that. A Andrew, from your perspective, Oh, sorry. Yes, Sasha. No, I was just going to add, I mean, another thing that kind of has come out, um, you know, in boards and, and management is that you've seen a lot more emergent structures happening, i.e. authority being pushed down into the organization, simply because people didn't have the time to have the luxury that we were used to in having, you know, information sent to us two weeks in advance so that we can look at it as a board member. People were having to be given, you know, the authority to make decisions because they were dealing with things. And also the crisis team, you know, being multifunctional, coming together, being able to deal with that, and then the, coming to the board at a later stage. So it was interesting to see that more authority was actually pushed down within the organization as well. And Andrew, from your perspective, do you see that happening, continuing? Do you see a change back to a new normal? You're on you're mute, probably the most said, the biggest learning out of the out of the uh, the pandemic is the you are you are on mute phrase. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sorry, one oh one error there. I should be talking <laughs> to you about technology today. Um yeah, look, I think absolutely. Um I think uh, you know John John touched on it. I think uh, Aisha touched mm -hmm. on it. Um the world the world has changed. Um some some instances for the better, in many instances not for for the better. But I think it has changed whether we like it. I think, you know, COVID was in some ways the perfect storm. Um, you know, apart from catching a lot of people off guard and really testing internal policies and strategies and whatever. But yeah, you know, I think there were two two quite important things. You know, the the laws and governance never changed through all of this. Um, you know, there might have been knee-jerk responses and the odd ad hoc uh, directive for, you know, we saw it in Europe and Australia and, and and the like around, you know, relaxing the ability to hold virtual meetings and whatever. Now they're sort of going back and you know, I've actually included on the portal a paper that I wrote recently on, on you know, the future of general meetings in, in the world. Um, but I think, you know, what 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 this did require was that agility, that innovation. You know, we were dealing with a scenario where there were adequate laws in place, but the laws were never designed, or the codes or the guidelines were never designed for this type of scenario. So, <clears throat> excuse me, boards and, and management were really being called to um, apply their minds to these this new this new order or this new business, but within a framework of existing codes and laws. And I think that that caused a lot of angst and a lot of stress because again things like ethical leadership you know um, being able to think out of the box um, applying principles of fairness reasonableness and equity um, often had to trump you know hard and fast legal maxims or laws or whatever um, you know definitely the role the key role players changed um, you know and if i just go through them quickly i mean the company secretary you know i know you wrote an article many years ago about the company secretary being a a polymath. Um, I think uh, you probably even when you drafted that, Lauren, never even anticipated that we would end up where, you know, poly polymath went from a, a, a term to an actual reality. Um, you know, the glue that held and has to hold the board and the management teams and coordinate a lot of these initiatives fell to the company secretary. You know, um, far more, uh, you know, uh, meetings, uh, but less time taken up, much more accurate minutes, managing the flow of information, uh, making sure that the board remained compliant, that best principles of governance were still obviously implemented and practiced. You know, that was a, a huge responsibility of the company secretary. The, the chief executive officer, I mean, if ever there was a lonely place for any officer of a company to be in the last 18 months, it must have been the CEO. You know, apart from obviously having to deal with and be responsible for implementing a strategy that the board had endorsed that now maybe had been thrown out the window. 
Um, things like risk management, dealing with employees, succession planning. I mean, many companies lost their CFOs, CEOs, whatever, to people leaving industries because they had been in lockdown for prolonged periods. Um, you know, managing that relationship with the chairman, building that relationship with the chairman, building that relationship with the board, having the board trust you as the captain of the ship, so to speak, in terms of navigating it through these these choppy waters. Um, you now the chairman's role changed profoundly. Um, you know, managing a board in a physical meeting, now managing a board on a virtual meeting, not reading body language, not you know necessarily feeling that you're allowing proper consultation and engagement. Um, you now the board, and I think John touched on it earlier. You know, there was that, and I've heard it on both sides. You know, some boards would say to you that almost management hijacked the process and almost ran the company and the board was an afterthought to, you know, again, and I come back to the role of the company secretary saying, well, we've got a business to run here and we've got to implement a strategy as a management team, but we can't do it on our own. We still have to abide by and make sure that, you know, the board, so and I'll come to that in a short while. And then obviously your shareholders, you know, the collaboration. Um, if I just look at our industry, you know, we had to deal with employees. We had laid off thousands and thousands of employees retrenched. Um, you know, most of our staff went down to 40% of salary for about eight months. Um, you know, having to keep them engaged, the supply chain, getting extended terms, you know, for payment to... Uh, renegotiating bank funding and and uh, and lending with your with your uh, your major sort of uh, financiers. So, to... Andrew, may I ask? I mean, sorry to interrupt. Just 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 yes. um. So as a result of that, I mean, obviously there was a lot to be done in the pandemic. Do you see any of that having carried through now into a semi post pandemic world in, in relation to board operation, um, or do you think we've reverted to more traditional roles? No, I think there's, I think it's a bit of a hybrid, Lauren. I think, you know, we're going to, I think, you know, there's a lot of positives that came out of this as well. I mean, you know, do, do board members need to travel, you know, seven, eight times a year on an airplane to a board meeting? Well, no, they don't, you know. So I think, you know, I do think that we found that, you know, from a climate point of view, from a efficiency and from a, from many other perspectives, there are better ways of doing it, you know, for simple admin functions, teams, Zoom meetings can will continue. Will strategies and boards always be by teams? And will general meetings be by teams? No, I don't think so. I think we'll see more of a hybrid model coming out of this where um, you know, investors will want to have that optionality of either attending a physical meeting or, or participating remotely via, via teams. Um, you know, more admin stuff, routine stuff will probably be done via teams meetings going forward. Um, relationships with communities, with supply chains, and that I think this has created a huge awareness around one's license to operate social compact with the communities that we operate in and around. Um, we need each other as much as they need us. And I think that maybe that uh, um, sort of unequal leverage or bargaining power of the corporate has changed a little bit, I think, going forward. I think there's a lot more appreciation for, as we said earlier, the, the more stakeholder inclusive approach than, than shareholder exclusive. Um, Sorry. And I think, yeah. yeah. But, Sorry, Andrew, yeah. just conscious of time. Can we? Um, sure. So to just, I just wanted to get Aisha's last views on that, just because some of the bits you did raise on, on sort of Aisha, on um, the sort of changing where decisions were being taken, pushed down into the organization. Hopefully some of that effectiveness may have, have sort of lasted. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what it's done is it's allowed the board to, to you know, one, it's empowered the employees, which I think is a positive, um, one of the positive aspects, you could say, um, from COVID. But it's also, as and I think Andrew is, you know, talking live to it, is that it's brought in more systems that need to be in place. So I think it, it allowed us to kind of see that we could probably allow a little bit more delegation to go to go down to the employees but i also think i mean you know really what's kind of happened i'd say you had the initial period of the firefighting and then you had the period 
you know, a little bit after. So say first the first six months and then, you know, the last 12 months, say. And I think what what's kind of happened in the next 12 months, last 12 months is really about them building the resilience out of that. So what has worked? You know, have the scenario plans worked? Has the business continuity plan worked? This crisis team, how do you then embed that so that it's there permanently when it's needed to be pull, pulled up? I think those are the things that you find that have been, you know, some of the learnings that have been then embedded into the culture. Right. Thanks, Andrea and, and Ash, for that input. John, I mean, obviously, this was a hugely disruptive event. Um, it's everybody's scenario planning. Ash was talking about scenario planning, but this is everybody's sort of scenarios coming at once, incredibly disruptive because of the nature of the immediacy with, it, with which it all happened. What do you see as potential other disruptive forces that boards need to be considering? Well, as I said earlier, I think these changes are fundamental and they are permanent. Um, looking at the US and uh, public companies, we are already seeing uh, an increase in companies' vulnerability to shareholder activism on ESG issues and on human resources issues, on a lot of these uh, factors that were highlighted by the pandemic, but that were already in place with the ESG movement. And this activism reflects um, the growing involvement of stakeholders, including shareholders. Institutional investors have been affected by this, uh, what um, uh, Andrew described as a perfect storm, which I think is a very good description of what we've been through. The institutions are thinking very differently now about how they look at portfolio companies, how they analyze them, what are the risk factors, how do they factor in all of these intangibles. Uh, they have to retrain their investment staff who have been used to thinking in terms of financial uh, metrics exclusively. Um, those metrics don't necessarily work for environmental and human factors and social impact of the company. So uh, activism is certainly going to drive a lot of these changes home. Another um, uh, change that I think is fundamental and is going to present challenges for uh, companies is corporate reporting and disclosure. Um, compliance has always been the modus operandi in this area. People look to see what regulators require, and that's what they disclose. The problem with these ESG factors and the pandemic is that they are unique to individual companies. And um, generic standards of what should be reported um, uh, in order to inform a, a quote, average shareholder information that uh, a shareholder would want to have in making a, a, a trade or a buy or a sell decision. That's not enough anymore. Uh, we're going to see much more customized reporting uh, because that's the only kind that really works on these ESG and, and uh, individual factors. So the old uh, compliance mentality that um, has always been very essential to how corporations communicate, that's going to have to change and they're going to have to have the courage to tell their own stories, even if those stories require uh, pushing out of the boundaries of disclosure. Um, I think third factor is that the movement towards integrated reporting and integrated thinking and strategic decision making are going to have a very big impact on the traditional corporate structures and organizational charts. Most large companies and particularly listed companies have very clearly defined jobs, the job of the corporate secretary, company secretary, the job of the general counsel, the job of uh, communications, perhaps there's a CSR executive and so forth. Uh, but when you're dealing with these issues, you have to deal with them collectively. Uh, you have to um, bring together all of these different groups so that they are, in fact, 
uh, working to achieve a common solution and looking at the problems from the perspective of the company's corporate purpose and uh, as well as its risk and value creation opportunities. Um, so integration is something that I think long-term uh, is going to have a very big change on the way companies think and behave and are managed. I think that the, also that the board's duty of oversight, um, as I said earlier, now uh, is going to require something beyond the internal controls that looked exclusively at financial results. Uh, there are going, the directors and the management are going to have to create a new set of internal controls that help them look at environmental issues, uh, social issues, human capital management, sustainability issues, uh, as well as, as how these issues are being handled by the competition. And the implications uh, for companies, uh, they're gonna have to move quickly. There's a case in the US that is sending chills through boardrooms. So this involves Boeing aircraft and the uh, lawsuits arriving, uh, arising from the MAX aircraft failure. Um, a, a recent court in Delaware has accepted a theory of action that uh, the board uh, was responsible for a failure of oversight for not paying attention to these safety factors and for dealing with them in, in the allegations at any rate, um, as if this was really a kind of public relations issue and not a true and fundamental business issue of concern to the board of directors and um, all of the players at the company. And I think finally, as I said earlier, we're going to have to question the value of the traditional audit process. Reliance on financial audit standards is no longer sufficient to give you a, a full and complete picture of a company's health, uh, including its financial health. And so I think that the, um, the audit uh, community is grappling and audit uh, regulators are, are grappling with the ways in which the audit can take into account these uh, intangibles and quote non-financial, which is I think a, not a good term to use because these ESG factors and the pandemic have clear financial impact. It's just that they don't lend themselves easily to financial metrics. So uh, these are very big issues for companies and they're going to have to really start thinking in very fundamental ways about how they are managed and how they conduct their business. Thanks, John. I think that um, I think that's a, a good follow on, on the impact of, as we said earlier, on a sort of stakeholder inclusive mo model versus sh shareholder primacy is looking at different ways we can measure what you've referenced as those intangibles. Um, Maria Stahl, from a policy perspective, um, obviously, Regulators had a key role to play in relation to resilience, but what do you see as evolving trends that boards should be aware of and should focus on going forward? Yeah, thanks, Lorraine. Yeah, one thing that we should reflect first is can what was the direct impact, you know, uh, uh, of this crisis that we have seen, you know, and that really are confronting boards, is really the increased discontent of from shareholders and stakeholders against some, you know. You know about some companies' action and the increase in litigation and lawsuits. That's something that is very interesting to look at. You know, in the year and a, a year and a half uh, uh, that we just had, lawsuits concerns mainly, you know, of course, inaccurate, misleading disclosure, stock market manipulation, insider trading, non-compliance with health regulation. You know, this increase of activism also that John was mentioning. This is a real challenge now. So shareholders have been suing much more companies, you know, for understating or not properly disclosing risk related to the, to, to the pandemic, but also employees, uh, you know, they've been suing companies for not following uh, kind of official guidance on, on health requirements uh, on the spread of the, of, of the virus. 
So this has really notable impact for, for, for the board. And let me just give you one, one number that I found very interesting, you know, uh, the um, the increase of uh, insurance costs for uh, directors and uh, and executives. You know what we have noticed is in in Q2 2020, the average price of insurance premiums paid, you know, to protect directors and senior executives from lawsuit, have increased by 60 percent in the U.S. So it really shows, you know, the the, the, the importance of the responsibility of boards and their members. So all the result of this lawsuit that we have following, you know, that we've been following that are really related to, to, to the pandemic, it's, it's a bit difficult to have already some conclusions because most of them are not yet uh, concluded, but it will bring some reflection and, and, and some lessons for boards. Uh, so what we have noticed is that boards are kind of failed to effectively monitor management and prevent litigation for many three reasons. And let me highlight some lessons learned on, on, on that. The first reason was a lack of adequate flows of information, you know, between the management to the directors at the beginning of the pandemic. Of course, there was a kind of urgency, but that has led to kind of a late involvement of the board. You know, first crisis was managed by the management, but then the board could not react quickly. So this call for a first lesson, how we can improve, you know, the a smoother information flow and relationship between the board and the executive, especially in times of crisis. Second reason is the difficulty for directors, you know, at the beginning to be fully informed about the crisis. Of course, it was too much information in too little time, you know, it was a real crisis. And there was also a lot of time pressure for, for board directors, you know, we're sitting in different boards, different committees, too many boards sometimes also. So one of the lessons also maybe is this issue of overboarding. Will it be in the future a little bit more regulated? That's a question, but this is something that we probably would need to tackle. Third reason was the lack of expertise and, and technical expertise from board members. Of course, it was a health crisis. How to deal with that? It was rather difficult, you know. But then what is the lesson from here? That boards needs now much more skills and expertise. There was one question in the chat, you know, from from a person who is saying what support should be tech savvy, you know, of course, you know, much more, but will that change really the composition of the boards? Well, like uh, old uh, men uh, sitting on boards, will that change a little bit the composition? So that's a question that will also, of course, evolve. Let me sign just three other disruptive forces very quickly that I think we have not fully tackled is, first is the executive remuneration. That's really under scrutiny. So boards yeah. look at that also. Cybersecurity, we talked about it, you know, already for remote working arrangements. And also the question of insolvency and, and restructuring. You know, in case of financial distress we are in now, boards really should have the responsibility and the capacity to, to regularly evaluate, communicate on how a crisis impacts their ability to meet the, the, you know, the debt maturities, to build strategic alternatives, to maintain the business community. So that's really important to, 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 to have. And one last point regards, you know, of course, the crisis management and the role of audits. I found that what John was saying, you know, on the involvement, involvement of the audit job and the audit committee's job, you know, definitely it will evolve not only with the ESG kind of standardization, even though it can be customized to companies, but also is it the role of the audit committee to really deal with ESG risk? Or will, will there be, you know, a trend towards more uh, risk committees, risk management committees? And one thing that we have studied in the OECD in, the, in, in our fact book, we have seen that in the last five, six years. So even before the crisis, there was a real trend in regulation and asking, you know, uh, companies to, well, recommending or requiring companies to really deal with risk management and even to establish a separate 
committee to deal with risk. Now, 38% of jurisdiction, of, of the 50 jurisdiction that we are looking at, are really calling for a, a separate risk committee. So that's also a real trend, you know, and we believe that, of course, risk committee can really help and support the board, you know, in better addressing all the complex issues they will have to deal with. Thanks, Maria Stel. That's great. Um, and, and I agree. I think I think that we are going to see, um, certainly I'm in financial services, so obviously risk committees are a given, but certainly um, you can see how there might be an expansion of the need for those in, in, in other in other mm -hmm. sectors. Just to pick up on some of the questions that we have in the chat, and, and one I actually will pose to Aisha and, and Andrew, because it was something I was going to ask them to pick up on anyway. Um, we've spoken about the redefinition of the role of the board and what you might need to get to an agile board, one that can act in these kind of circumstances. Um, as Maria still pointed to, there is a question in here, Andrew, which I'll ask you to pick up on, um, which says that um, how do you deal with board members who are not tech savvy due to their age and therefore unable to effectively participate? But before if you could just think about your response to that, and Aisha, if I can just ask you, what do you think are maybe some of the key board composition, sort of the key board characteristics that you might, you think we might need for future fit and agile boards? I mean, it's, it's funny because I was looking at that technical uh, question myself. Um, look, I think reskilling and upskilling is, you know, a, a paramount and, and those are things that are going to have to be done, um, you know, uh, and, and I think COVID, all COVID did was push that agenda forward. I think that was moving, but it's again, especially on the technology front, I think that's just, you know, it shouted in your, in your face, if you like, the need. Um, and, you know, the question kind of was asking, I think, how do you do that when you have, you know, certain ages and certain abilities? Um, I think what you what needs to be done is, you know, potentially having working committees that are technology savvy people. Um, and potentially it is also bringing in the experts because, you know, we know technology moves at a very fast pace. Um, what's good today is, you know, is irrelevant tomorrow. So you kind of need to have people who are up to date with the latest technology. But it's not, uh, as I was kind of alluding to at the beginning of my, you know, talk, it's not only about adopting technology in, it's actually understanding the different types of technology, what fits for your organization, what doesn't fit, but having both the inclusiveness, so bringing technology not only as a, you know, it's an IT department, but it's actually in, integrated into the strategy. So it's fundamentally become, comes into every different business process, every operations, all the different elements, but also understanding what are the threats from technology. And, you know, we talked about cybersecurity, everybody today is on social media, the impact of that and how that even impacts your communication, your media strategy has to change. Um, you know, and, and another thing that's maybe come out as well is, you know, how responsible the, the individual employee is. And one of the boards that I was on, we, we did do the separation of a risk committee um, from the audit and risk. We had two different um, um, entities, two different committees looking at risk. And one of the key things that was coming out of it was the accountability of the individual employee when it comes to risk. Today, everybody walks around with a mobile phone, you know, and so the, there's, a, there's an accountability when you come to work and, and you reply to emails and you represent because you're going again back out into the technology sphere. So just understanding the different elements of that technology. But the other thing I just wanted to point out was um, you mentioned about the composition of boards. And I think diversity has been something that I, I've heard has meant that the boards who had more diversity on their panels, um, on their board members, actually performed better during the pandemic. And when they talk about their diversity, they're not only talking about women on boards, they're talking about age diversity, they're talking about experience diversity, they're talking about nationality diversity, um, because it's the composition of having different people who have seen different experiences and bringing that all together at a time when an uncertainty has happened. And so again, I think one of the things of COVID is that it will push forward the agenda of diversity. I know Philip mentioned in the beginning that, uh, you know, women have been impacted by COVID. And, and I think that is true. I think what you've seen is the bulk of um, some of the, the, the less fortunate things that have happened. And certainly when we talk about pushing women on boards, you know, I do think that hasn't been as at the top priority discussion um, on the agenda, simply because of the need of COVID and, and firefighting. But I do think that what the positive side of COVID is that it's shown that, you know, flexible working conditions can be taken up very easily. And so the excuses that potentially were there 12 months ago 
are no longer going to be viable. You know, women can work from home when their flexible yeah. options are much more there. And we've seen how different organizations, you know, are, have been talking about having, uh, you know, their employees working for, from home, et cetera. So I think, I, I think the composition is changing. And I think, you know, whether they like it or not, board members are going to have to understand technology, how they do that, how they educate themselves, whether they, uh, you know, give it to a working committee, whether they have a dedicated committee, whether they bring in, you know, the, 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 the bright ideas from people who have done, you know, uh, businesses in different types of technology. They're different. Thank you. Two points. Thanks, Asha. Andrew, just quickly, I think Asha's covered the technology piece, but if you have anything in relation to actual board composition or sort of behaviours, skills you might be looking for, love to hear it. Yeah, look, I think, I mean, just to answer that question that was posed, and there were two parts to it, you know, one was the tech savvy and the second, do we get rid of the director if he can't work it? Um, I think start of the latter first, absolutely no. I mean, you don't appoint directors to a board because they can work an iPad or a laptop um, you know, that's the first thing. Secondly, funny enough, the older generation have adapted to this from a practical perspective. I think they're a lot better and a lot quicker than some of the younger generations. So that being said, I mean, I do think, you know, again, I think you know, Yusha's picked it up. I mean, diversity is a, is a big factor. Um, I think one would want to look at diversity on boards for, for reasons beyond just the ability to control or operate technology. Uh, you know, the technology is easy to get around. I mean, you can access Teams on a mobile these days through an app. You can do it through a laptop. You know, what we did in Sun International, we actually got our board members iPads. We gave them a dongle and we did the, a, a training course for them. Um, and even after, you know, we load documents and hold meetings on Teams, um, we still send a PDF of that uh, board pack or meeting pack to them via email, which they can print. So. There are many ways to skin this Good. cat. I think you can get around it. Great. Thanks, Andrew. I'm conscious of time and two more questions that I really want to get to. The next one, John, I'd like to pose to you because I think it's it's quite pertinent um, around um, the whether we think that companies that embed ESG before the pandemic were better placed to navigate the crisis. I'd love to get your views on that. I hope so. <laughs> uh, I can't provide you with any actual evidence that that's true, but um, certainly it's clear that a company that uh, has focused on its purpose, a company that has uh, reconsidered what um, Bill referred to as, as the license to operate in and others referred to as the social compact, um, is is going to have uh, at least had a mindset that was open to the kinds of issues that uh, arose as a result of the pandemic. Um, I think that uh, companies are going to have to think more generically about their place in the world, not only in terms of competition, which they've always thought about, but in terms of their impact on uh, the various different communities that they serve. And uh, the pandemic was a lesson of the reverse of that, that things that go on in the world that are not directly related to the business or its, its competition can have a huge impact on, on the corporation. And one of the areas that I think that uh, directors have really neglected in the past is human resources. I, for one, have always argued that uh, in terms of executive comp, the way directors should be looking at the uh, compensation of the CEO and the top five or whatever group they're focused on should be deeply rooted in the compensation scheme for the company as a whole, because the health of the company um, as a team of individuals working together, which is really what a company is. It's a, it's, an, it's a human enterprise. It's a group of people working together. And the uh, compensation and incentives that, um, uh, that work effectively are the ones in which every employee uh, understands um, that 
what those drivers are, what those value drivers are, and how they will be rewarded. This has really not been the case in the past, particularly I think in the US, where um, executive comp, particularly CEO comp, has been driven mostly by uh, attract and retain considerations and by professional groups who advise directors on how to get the best CEO and to keep her Thanks, um, in place. So th these are very fundamental changes that um, I think are going to affect companies going forward. Great. Thanks, everybody. I want to, um, first of all, just apologize for if we didn't get to any questions that have been posed. Um, I think we've run over our time and conscious that everybody needs to go on a break. I um, want to finish off by thanking my panelists for the discussion. Hopefully, lots of food for thought that will be that will sort of continue and be picked up in various other discussions around the conference. So thank you to everybody. Thank you, Lorraine. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.